the town, and people are usually interested in being there. This year, we put out the call for discussion topics and got nothing. There was absolutely no interest at all in, in attending this particular event. So this, this raises an interesting question. This is a change. It makes you wonder, okay, what is going on there? So we can imagine a few possibilities here. One, of course, is this little pandemic thing that's been going on that has already foreclosed the possibility of meeting in person, of course. And I will come back to this in just a moment. Meanwhile, you can think that, okay, perhaps everybody in the kernel community is happy and everything is perfect. This is the explanation that will strike anybody who has hung out in the kernel community for any time as rather unlikely. But one never knows. Things do seem to be going very well. Or perhaps it's just the fact that it's a virtual conference this year. We'll see. We'll get back to some of these. But let's start with, with the pandemic, which has been a big issue in our world in general and in the kernel development community as well, of course. So one thing that it has cost us is the ability to meet in person. And what, what does that do to us? It costs us quite a bit. Right, in-person events give us the ability to see the people we work with, see our colleagues, maybe get a sense for what some of their other interests are, that sort of thing. Sometimes we um, see a little bit more than we wanted to see, but that's the way of it. Sometimes we see things we really do want to see about what's happening in our community and how things are changing and who's working in it. Sometimes we see things that can never be unseen. And often we just get the ability to put names to, to faces of the people that we've been seeing for a long time. So I'm going to take the opportunity here to exercise the polling mechanism that's built in the big blue button and to ask people out there, how many of you know who this is? I want to see how many of you are willing to date yourselves to the, to the point of, um, of identifying this person. And while you all are voting on this, I just want to add that beyond the ability to get together for beers and so on, what meeting a person does is it takes our globally distributed community, a community that is pretty much exclusively mediated electronically, and it lets us actually see each other's faces and hear each other's voices. And that pays back in a lot of ways. It allows us to solve problems often in just a few minutes that can take a month of painful email discussions to get through. And it also leaves you in a place where when you go home afterwards and you read an email from somebody you shared a beer with, you hear their voice in your head as you're reading the words they wrote, and you realize, okay, that is the way this person speaks. That's just the way they talk. They are not actually attacking anybody, whatever. It smooths the way we interact with each other in, in a great many ways. And that is, um, is something that is very valuable to us. It's something that, that we are losing with all this. So we're not getting very many votes. Only half of you have voted. The rest of you are not willing to commit. But I'll put up the results here in just a moment. Um, I'm still trickling in. Vote, vote, vote. All right. You're running out of time. Here goes. The, the results are pretty queer, clear in any case, which are that, in fact, nobody knows who this is. This person is Don Becker. Once upon a time, if you were running a Linux system, you, you were almost certainly using an Ethernet driver that he wrote. He, he wrote pretty much all the Ethernet drivers we had back in the 90s, once upon a time. He is also one of the creators of a concept that was once called a Beowulf cluster, which was the idea that if you collect a whole bunch of Linux systems together, cheap Linux systems, connect them with a high-speed interconnect, you get something that can outperform the fastest supercomputers that were running at the time. This architecture is, of course, what is now considered just to be a supercomputer computer, or what we just call a data center anymore. So this is one of the many important people in our community you would have met if you had been attending events at that time. Um, part of our history that not all of us have in mind anymore. Anyway, just to conclude this, I want to say that um, the ability to, to meet in person has, has cost us in a lot of ways, and it will continue to hurt us in the long term if we are unable to meet in person if this goes on for a long time. Hopefully that will not be the case. Meanwhile, it's worth thinking about what has the effect been in the shorter term? What has the effect been on the actual code that we are creating in the kernel? So this gives us the opportunity to look at the slide that I put up pretty traditionally. In these talks, 
just reviewing the releases that we have done over the last year or so. So if you look, you see that over the last 13 months, we have, or will have shortly, released, put out seven kernel releases. We are continuing to maintain our cadence of about one release every nine or 10 weeks. We're continuing to bring in more developers. And in fact, it looks like we are gonna set a record in 5.8 for the most developers we have ever had in a single kernel development cycle. And we are bringing in more and more changes as well. 5.8 will not be a record, I don't think, for the number of change sets. It's probably gonna be number two. But we're gonna get a lot of stuff into this kernel. So in this regard, at least, it does not appear that we have slowed down, even though the world as a whole has slowed down in a lot of ways. Another way of looking at this is to, with these two plots here, the upper plot up here just plots the, the number of patches that were posted on any given day that eventually made it into the main line. So these are patches that were accepted by the day they were posted. As you see there was one day in January where we had almost 500 patches posted that were merged. Other days were rather less. The bottom plot down here is the number of patches that were merged into a, into a Git repository on the path into the main line. So if you look over the period of, of the most lockdowns and that sort of stuff, you don't really see any kind of a drop in activity here. But the only thing you might see is a bit of a drop in merging activity at the beginning of April. And I believe that has a lot more to do with the opening of the 5.7 merge window then than anything else. If anything, we're seeing that the activity has increased a bit, that perhaps all of this lockdown has given many of us the excuse to do what we really wanted to do anyway, which is just to hide in one of our keyboards and work on the code. So it doesn't really appear that in the short term, at least, we are, we are suffering much from, from, from the larger world events. And that is a good thing. Longer term, we will see how things, how things hold up. So if we think back to why it is that we aren't, don't have any interest in the maintainer summit this year, I don't think that the pandemic is it, right? We're still as busy and as active as we ever were in the kernel community, if anything more so. So perhaps it really is that everybody is happy about where things are going. And, you know, there, there may be some truth to this. It's running pretty smoothly. And even, for example, the discussion on adopting more inclusive terminology didn't really upset all that many people in the end. We were able to, to deal with things and to go forward in a pretty good way. The other alternative is that a virtual maintainer summit just looks like yet another damn video conference. And we've had enough of those and people don't want to do that. And that is probably a part of this as well. This is something that we are contending with as we try to organize the Linux Plumbers Conference because we really want to try to create an event that preserves as much of what we value in our in-person events as we can, the ability to have discussions, to get to know each other, to solve problems. We will see how successful we will be, but we are certainly going to try to do that. So moving on, while we're talking about kernel releases, most of us, of course, do not actually run the mainline kernels that, that Linus is putting out. We run something that is derived from the stable updates that Greg and company are, are releasing. There are currently six kernels under maintenance by these folks. And as you can see, they're getting a lot of updates, a lot of patches. In fact, some of these kernels have received over 200 updates and well over 17,000 patches going into them. These numbers, by the way, are a couple of weeks old. They're bigger now, of course. So if you think 17,000 changes going into what's supposed to be a stable kernel is a lot. That's more than a full development cycle's worth of, of changes going into a stable kernel release. This can be seen as being a lot of churn, and it, it brings up a perennial, perennial sort of discussion issue in our community, which is, are stable updates too unstable? Are we shoving too much stuff into them in our effort to get all of the fixes in there? And the truth of the matter is, of course, that we are occasionally merging patches into the stable kernels that should not be there. We see some occasional regressions, including a pretty unpleasant file system data corruption regression that went in a little bit over a year ago. It only lasted for a release or two. It wasn't there for long. It didn't affect a whole lot of people, but it should never have gotten there in the first place. I did some, some analysis a while back and concluded 
that something on the order of 2% or so of the changes going into the stable updates require further fi changes to fix them later on. They were telling all, of course, regressions. Some of them are just fixes that were not complete fixes that could be improved in some way, whatever. Many of them, most of them perhaps, didn't really affect anybody. But the truth of the matter is you cannot add 17,000 patches to a stable kernel and not destabilize a little something here and there sometimes. That's just the, the nature of the beast term. But on the other hand, the other side of this is if you think about the much more curated stable kernels like you find in enterprise distributions, and you see examples like this. This is an advisory that was put out by Red Hat just last month for a local root vulnerability that they found and they fixed in the enterprise kernel. They assigned a nice 2020 CVE number to it and all of that. But if you look at it closely, what you see here is that this particular fix landed in the upstream kernel at the beginning of 2019, about 18 months before it was fixed in this particular enterprise kernel. It also made it into the stable kernel shortly after it was merged upstream. So anybody who was running stable kernels was never really vulnerable to this particular problem. Whereas those who were running enterprise kernels had to wait for this to be discovered for a advisory to be put out and then rush out and apply an update to get the fix for it. And it's, it's always going to be this way because the simple fact of the matter is we don't know which of the many fixes we are merging are security fixes. The nature of the kernel is such that many of our problems turn out to be security problems once somebody who's sufficiently clever and motivated figures out a way to exploit them. So the, the truth of the matter is that if you want to get all of the fixes, the only way to do that really is to get all of the fixes. And I think we're seeing more distributors coming around to this point of view as, as we move along here. And one that I want to talk about in particular that's worth mentioning here is the um, Android generic system image, where some interesting things are happening. The generic system image is an Android or a portion of an Android system put together by Google, which when combined with any particular vendor changes, must run on, on a vendor's device for that device to be certified as an Android capable device. So um, there are some nice aspects of this. One of the things being that they're working on moving the, the mainline kernel into the generic system image as opposed to being something that the vendors provide. This is something that hasn't happened quite yet, but it's getting there. But even now, the generic system image requires that and it vendors ship a relatively recent stable update. So if you're running updates, or if you're running Android, then you are getting the fixes now. You're getting all of these fixes. And the Android folks have said that they are, in fact, finding that most of the bugs that are found in the kernel, most of the security bugs, are already fixed in the stable updates by the system. So once the, the, the stable kernels actually become part of the generic system image, then they will track the stable updates even more closely, and you will be even that much closer to the current state of the art with, with the stable updates. And this is going to be a good thing, assuming, of course, you're running a system that's actually getting updates, which is a separate problem. But we can hope for improvements in that area as well. Another nice feature of all this is that once the, the stable kernel becomes part of the generic system image, Vendors can only ship any kernel changes of their own as loadable modules. So they will still be able to ship, say, a device driver if they need to do that. But they will not be able to do things like replace the scheduler or apply nasty patches to the scheduler, that sort of thing. This is going to bring all these devices much closer to the main line. And this is going to be a good development for, for everybody involved, I believe. But it raises an interesting question about all those, those core patches that the that the device manufacturers are shipping now. So it's causing people to look at them a little bit more closely. At a separate online conference that was held a couple of, of months ago at the OSPM event, we had a presentation from a developer at Lenaro who had looked at a few scheduler patches that were being shipped by one chipset vendor and discovered that there were, in fact, significant power savings that were realized by applying these patches to the scheduler. 
So we may sneer at a lot of patches that handset vendors are shipping, and we may think that they are in fact not really developed with an idea, with a thought towards long-term maintenance, or working beyond anything except the specific device they're developed for. But the simple truth of the matter is that these patches do exist for a reason. And if we want to get to a point where device vendors feel that they don't need to ship a whole lot of patches to the kernels that they're shipping, then we need to find a way to get those changes into the mainline kernel and, and really make sure that it works for everybody the way we need to work. We're getting there. This is happening, but it's, it's an ongoing process. So, moving on, you can't really give a talk about the state of the kernel, of course, without talking about BPF, the um, increasingly misnamed Mercury packet filter. BPF, for those of you who aren't aware of it, is an in-kernel virtual machine. It allows user space to build and compile a program for this virtual machine, load it into the kernel, and actually run it in the context of the kernel itself. There's a just-in-time compiler in the kernel, so these, these programs run very quickly, which is important for reasons that we will get to. There's also a verifier built into the kernel. It does a great deal of static analysis. It makes it sure makes that the sure programs will not access, access memory, 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 memory should not access. Should not access. Make sure that they, sure they will not live forever, forever. The various of the things, make sure the sure programs, programs are safe, safe, safe for, for the, the, the kernel, kernel to run. And then there's the increasing the long list of places where we can attach these programs. We will look at a few of those in just a second. So BPF is interesting for a few reasons. One is that it allows users to add new functionality to the kernel without the need to bring in a kernel developer, without the need to think about getting changes upstream. It gives a whole lot more flexibility to the users of the kernel in an awful lot of ways. But there's also an interesting performance benefit that can come from the use of BPF. If you think about something like the packet filtering code that we have in the kernel now, the firewalling code, it has to be built for the general case. It has to support pretty much any kind of filtering or any kind of test that any system administrator anywhere may want to apply to a packet. And so it's large. There's a lot of code that is probably not being used in any specific firewall deployment. There are a lot of tests for features that are not actually being used there. This bolts the code, it slows it down, if instead you can write a little BPF program that does what you need and only what you need, that program is small, is focused, it doesn't have to satisfy the general case, and it can, in many cases, run a lot more quickly. And so that brings performance advantages that people are very interested in. So there are a lot of places where BPF is showing up. I can't even begin to look at them all. But one that was recently merged is the rather strangely named BPF iterator. What this really does is it allows the loading of a BPF program that will create a file much like the files you see in slash poc or in sysfs. These files are virtual files created by the kernel that export some aspect of the kernel's internal state to user space. They can be read as, as a file, and you can see what's going on inside the kernel. There's always interest in adding more information to these files, adding more files on the user side. Kernel developers tend to resist doing that because anything you add as one of these virtual files becomes part of the kernel's API and can never be changed again. So even now, we have files in slash, slash proc that are exporting information that really makes no sense in current kernels. So often there's just a zero in that field or whatever, but that has to stay there forever because programs using those files expect that information to be there. With the BPF iterator, you can make your own little file that contains exactly the information you need, perhaps information that is not currently exported by any other file out there. And there are no ABI, no ABI issues that kernel developers have to be worried about. Maybe there are some working issues there that we continue to discuss, and we will see if that holds true in the long term. But it adds a level of flexibility that I think users are going to appreciate. We recently merged the Linux security module that allows the attachment of a BPF program to any of the vast number of security hooks in the, in the Linux kernel. You can actually use this to, do, to make security decisions. These, these modules can do that. But that's not the purpose here. Instead, this 
particular module was created by Google to collect information about the behavior of the system as a whole, to get a picture of what's going on in the system. This then gets fed to one of their scary machine learning systems to try to flag things that look unusual, to try to get a sense that something has gone wrong on one of their systems and, uh, and intervene before something terrible happens, such as somebody goes in and tweets out um, Bitcoin scams from famous names or whatever else might go on and something like that happens. So that's the purpose of that. I don't, we haven't really seen that in use yet, but I think we will in the, in the near future. The BKF compiler collection, for anybody who hasn't looked at it, is definitely worth a look. This is a huge collection of tools that attach BPF programs to trace points to kernel probes and other places to extract information from the kernel to gain, a, and in fact, from user space as well. It gains us a huge amount of visibility into what's going into the kernel that we could only have dreamed of a few years ago. The, the link for that is there. If you haven't messed with these, they're, they're worth a look. There's, there's a huge amount going on there that has been enabled by the addition of BPF in the kernel. And finally, I'll just mention BP Filter, which is a packet filtering firewalling system meant to someday perhaps replace the net filter system, intended to be entirely compatible with that. And it should be uh, quite fast for the reasons that I have mentioned before. Um, the problem with BP Filter is that it got merged and the work on this has kind of stalled for the last couple of years. But they say that they're going to get back to work on it in some time in the near future. So at some point, maybe we will be using that. We will see where we will go with that in the future. But regardless of that, the simple fact remains that a lot is happening with BPF. I can't begin to touch it all. But it well, was well summarized by Tok late last year when he said that we seem to be continuing our march towards just becoming a BPF runtime powered microkernel. And that may well be our future. It's going to be interesting to watch what happens with BPF. A separate development that maybe you can see as being related is a subsystem called IOU Ring, which was merged just over a year ago now. IOU Ring is a new approach to asynchronous I.O. in the kernel. We have supported asynchronous I.O. for quite a long time, but nobody has ever been really happy with the implementation we had. It's, it's difficult to work with in the kernel. It's difficult to work with in user space. It doesn't work in all situations. It really honestly only works for a few use cases. And so it hasn't been heavily used, and people have wanted to replace it for a long time. There have been many abortive attempts to do so. IOU ring appears to have succeeded. It allows the creation of a couple of ring buffers that in memory that is shared between user space and the kernel. User space can then put IO requests into one of those ring buffers that are fed into the kernel, and results from the, each of those operations when they complete shows up in the other ring buffer. If you are going quickly and you keep those buffers full, you can do I.O. without the need to do any system calls at all. And that, of course, speeds things up quite a bit because system calls, even if they are fast on Linux, not quite so fast in the area of uh, hardware vulnerabilities, but so be it. Even if they are fast, they still slow things down. If you can avoid doing all those contact switches, you are going to make things go quite a bit faster. So. IO Ring has gained some users pretty quickly. I see a lot of other places, a lot of other projects working on adding support for it. It is gaining support for system calls beyond just straight IO. You can do things like open files in there now. There are ways of marking some operations as being contingent on the success of other operations before them succeeding. So you can add some sequencing to it, even though the whole thing is asynchronous. And um, the whole thing may eventually become a concept that was often described as slits or fibrils, that sort of thing, when it was discussed 10 years or so ago, and a way of doing just about anything asynchronous. It's becoming essentially a language to describe a set of operations that you want the kernel to complete asynchronously and tell you about when it's all done. It is not yet integrated with BPF. There's no way to put BPF programs in there, even though it was discussed at one point. But we may well get there. Stay tuned with that. So that's it for that. I wanted to talk a little bit about device drivers. Device drivers being, of course, the bulk of, of the kernel code base. Now, I'm not going to talk about writing device drivers in Rust, even though there seems to be some effort 
So I'm interested in that now. If you want to learn about that, you're going to have to come to the Linux Plumbers Conference, where there's going to be what seems to be a pretty high profile session on how we can support the ability to write device drivers in a safer language. And we're doing it now. Instead, I want to talk about a different thing about how we approach device drivers in general. The traditional idea of a device driver is that it manages all interactions with a specific peripheral device and provides a standard interface to the rest of the system. A device driver abstracts away anything that makes a specific device unique and makes it look like just all the other ones. So once you put a device driver in front of a particular device, you have just yet another terminal or yet another block device or yet another whatever. And you've hidden anything that's unique to the device. There's no better way to demonstrate that than looking at this, this diagram I stole from the BCC people. If you look at it, device drivers are down here, and there's layers and layers of stuff between the device drivers and, and anything that's actually going on in the rest of the system. Right? Device drivers really are hiding any aspect of, of the device from the rest of the system. So this has worked for us for quite a while now, but Hardware is getting increasingly complex, making it very hard to do this. So think, for example, about the video for Linux subsystem, the subsystem that's driving the camera that's showing my ugly face to you right now. Even some years ago, camera devices were somewhat complex in that you had a sensor sitting there, you had a DNA bridge moving data from that sensor to in the memory, you have maybe an iceberg C link talking to the two. And all these things had to be orchestrated and made to work together to look like a, a generic device, even though that device could provide a whole lot of video formats, that sort of thing. If you look at what's going on in contemporary devices, say in your, your phone, there's all of that stuff. Plus, there are color space converting modules. There's a, a little box in there that can do rotation and flipping. There's one that does face recognition. There's one that does autofocus. There's one that will split video streams into different directions and so on. And all of this stuff is in the form of a set of hardware modules that all have to talk to each other. They have to be configured to work together to work the camera the way the, the application that is running right now wants to run it, and so on. Creating a generic user space API to control this is hard. The video for Linux people, to their credit, have done it. They've done it, and, and it works. But if you look at this API, it's, it's very complex. It's a long, long series of IOPL calls that you have to do to, to make all this stuff work. And, and they're having to continue to work to continue to do this. But there are other sorts of devices, other places in the kernel, where the developers have long since given up. And the classic example, of course, is graphics processors, GPUs, where for a long time, it just hasn't been possible to, to provide a generic interface at the, at the kernel level. You just cannot hide the details of how this complex device works. We're seeing more such devices, including things like AI core processors, that are raising a lot of the same sorts of issues out there. So the drivers for these kinds of devices are different. They don't look the way device drivers used to do. They can't really abstract the device. Instead, they're really just a communications channel. They're almost like a network link to a remote system. They're passing operations requests to the device. They're passing other data back, but they don't really know what is going on with the device itself. And the real driver code lives in user space. That's where the actual driver lives. And so any kind of standard interface, if it exists at all, is provided by this user space blob and not by the kernel. And this raises some issues. <clears throat> this includes the fact that these devices still have to interact deeply with, with other parts of the low-level kernel. So for example, these GPUs and these AI coprocessors have their own memory management unit in them. They're able to page data in and out from main kernel memory into their own memory. And this necessitates a whole level of negotiation arbitration between the kernel and the device over who owns a particular range of memory at any given time and being able to transfer that ownership back and forth. This led to the merging of, of a module called heterogeneous memory management. It took a couple of years to do this because it's highly complex. And it's something that actually not a whole lot of people, I think, really understand. And we're still arguing about how a lot of that stuff should really work to make these devices work well. 
but it also raises licensing issues because it's really easy for the user space component to be proprietary. And if you do that, then your, your whole driver is proprietary. And your system as a whole is proprietary at that point. And there are a lot of problems with that. One of these is that when you have a proprietary driver in user space, you can no longer safely make changes to the kernel side of it because you don't know what the effects will be on the user space part. And you never know when you will break things. You will never be able to improve how all of that stuff works. And so for this, this reason, the GPU developers have for years required that any driver they merge into the kernel must have a free open source user space component that goes with it, that implements the functionality of the device as a whole, so that they can work with the driver for the device as a whole and manage this thing and maintain it going forward. We are seeing this, this particular policy has not been applied to other sorts of devices like AI coprocessors, but that is changing as, as we realize that we really need to have a handle on user space components as well. So this may seem like an obscure sort of licensing issue that not everybody cares about, but the simple fact of the matter is that we have worked for years and years and years to develop our free operating system. It's an important thing. It's something that we all depend on, and we need to keep it. We do not want to regress back to a time when we have a proprietary system that we no longer have control over. And to do that, we have to stay on top of this and make sure that all of our systems are, in fact, truly free and open source. So I want to talk briefly about code cleanups. This is not something that is often a, a topic of, of talks, talks like this, but I think there's an aspect of this that we should shine a light on because it's important. So. Here is a bit of code that was recently in our kernels. It, it's actually yeah, one of those complex GPU drivers. It looks like pretty ordinary code. It's a switch statement uh, implementing a couple of commands. Here you want to either enable or disable a particular IRQ state. It looks pretty fine, but there is something that is wrong here. And if you look at it for any time at all, you, you realize what it is, but you have to look for it. And the problem, of course, is that there is a missing break statement between those two cases. And so this being C, the control will silently flow from the disable case directly into the enable case, re-enable the thing that somebody thought they disabled, and generally lead to a state that probably does not create happiness for the world as a whole. So we have lots and lots of these sorts of bugs in the kernel. Or actually, more to the point, we used to have lots and lots of these sorts of bugs in the kernel. But we don't, so we don't anymore, anymore. Thanks to thanks Gustavo, who went through Gustavo and submitted to Emerge, submitted up Emerge, and patched the pipe, putting up every fault in every fault through case, case in the kernel, and either verifying, verifying that, that the code, code was correctly written, written, written and annotating, annotating that with the comments, comments to say so, or fixing it. And in this process, he fixed an awful lot of bugs in the kernel, some of which had been working there for many, many years. We see a lot of this kind of work going on in the kernel as a whole. Some of it, like the, the follow-through work, is supported by, by groups like the Linux Foundation, which supported that work. Other parts of it are just done by people who care about a particular part of the kernel and do it. Various encoding style changes or white space fixes or typo fixes or moving kernel to safer APIs that we've developed over time or many other things like that. This is the sort of work that sometimes irritates kernel developers because it can get in their way as they're trying to do other things. But it is important work. It is work that, um, that I hope will continue. It is something that we see as, as a big part of the thousands of packages that emerged into every development cycle. And so I think we need to say thank you to the people who are doing this work because they are fixing some of the technical debt that we have accumulated over the years. And they're helping to keep our kernel maintainable over the long term. Because we've been doing this for a while, and we intend to continue doing it for a fair while. So the last thing I want to talk about here, when my voice gives out, is tools. Uh, tools for the development of the kernel. So some years ago, there's a guy named Frederick Brooks who wrote a book called The Mythical Man Month. And this book is famous for the phrase, adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. So give the guy credit. He wrote this in 1975. He might have phrased it differently if you were to write it now. 
But still, the truth of the, of the claim is that if you add developers to a late software project, you're going to make it even later. So I thought about this for a second and looked at it. And if you look back at release 0 0.01, there was one developer. Right? By 2.6.20, we had 740. You contributed to the kernel. By 5.8, that number is old. We're at almost 1,900 developers now. So we're clearly adding developers to, to the kernel project. And the simple but sad fact is that we're 29 years in, heading towards 30, and we're still not done with this thing yet, right? So maybe Brooks had a point here. And um, maybe if we had stuck with fewer developers, maybe we would have finished this by now. Who knows? But that's not what I'm actually here to talk about. The other thing that Brooks said is he described a team that should surround any development project. This team should have a number of people, including a lead person he described as being analogous to a surgeon leading a surgical team. And one might argue that we have the surgeon complete with some of the behavioral characteristics that go with such people. But he also said that we need a toolsmith, somebody who is charged not with working on the end product, but with creating tools to be used by the people who are creating the end product of your team. So I would like to argue that the kernel for many years has lacked toolsmiths. There are over 4,000 people who contribute to the kernel over the course of a year's time, and there are still a lot of things that don't get done. There are, as there are really in any part of the open source community, there are these dark areas. There are bits of code that everybody depends on, but nobody sees it as their problem to go in and actually make them work better. There's nothing unique about the kernel with that, but we haven't. There's, of course, no part of the kernel that I care about that is like this. I have no particular dog in this fight, nothing to complain about. But I'd like to point out that um, tools have been, been one of these areas that nobody has really worked on for a long time. So, you know, we need to look no further than to say that this is the project that ran for 11 years without even using a source code management system. And we still lack many of the tools that, that other sorts of projects take for granted. So I think we have been kind of under underemphasizing this aspect of, of what we need. The good news is that things are changing. So once upon a time, we had really nothing in the way of testing tools at all for the kernel as a whole. We um, famously used to say, or at least some of us used to say, that testing is why we keep users around and why we do releases. But uh, it has kind of become clear over the years that maybe it's better to find some of our bugs before we inflict them on, on users. So we've seen the addition of a whole bunch of testing fuzzing tools, fuzzing tools like SysCaller and a few others that have found an awful lot of bugs before they've ever gotten out there, as well as finding a lot of old bugs that have been working for years. We have various sorts of sanitizers like the kernel address sanitizer and the recently added kernel concern, concurrency sanitizer, which can find data races in the kernel. These are the sorts of bugs that are really hard to find because they only happen once on uh, unnumbered years when running a specific accounting system on a system in Eastern Europe and only in the, if the moon is in the waning phase, right? They're really hard to reproduce and track down. But KCSON can find a lot of these things and help us to fix them before they, before they bite people. We've got various sorts of testing frameworks that are being, being added and so on. So our testing story, I think, is still not anywhere near what we need it to be at this point, but it is an awful lot closer to what we need it to be than it once used to be. There's a lot of good progress that is happening in this direction. And we're getting to the point where we have a decent story. But we've also started to see some changes in the area of tools for the development of the kernel as a whole. One of these is a thing called lore.kernel.org, which is more infrastructure than tool. Lore is an archive that contains almost all of the mailing lists that are used by kernel developers, quite a few of them. And as they built this, they have not only just added mailing list archives, but they went and they scratched up archives from other people anywhere on the net that they could find them. So there's a huge amount of our development history there, going back decades. It has become a really great research tool for figuring out what people were working on at any given time, why specific decisions were made, or if you want to find embarrassing quotes from people from the 1990s, whatever, it's all there. It's become an indispensable tool, something we all wonder how it is that we did without. More recent is a tool called V4. This is a script that was done by Constantine at the, at the Linux Foundation. 
the, the idea behind V4 is simple. You feed it a message ID, or you just pipe a, a patch from a series into it, and we'll extract the message ID from that. It will go to, to the archives at Lore, and we'll extract every patch that is part of a series. So if somebody has posted a 50 patch series, V4 will collect all of those 50 patches for you. We will also go and find all of the responses to those patches, things like review by tags or acknowledgments, that sort of thing, and apply all of those tags to the patches and package the whole thing up as a nice little mailbox file that you can apply to a Git repository with a single command. It's taken a whole bunch of tedious work that lots of us either did by hand or had our own really kludgy scripts to do and made a nice tool that, that just does that for us. That too has become indispensable in a real hurry. And we start to get grumpy if it fails to work on a specific patch series. Um, and you know, the interesting thing is that if you look at it, it's a nicely done script as well as implemented. It has grown over, over time, but it's really not that sophisticated a thing at this point. It just requires somebody to sit down and actually do it and then try to support it for the development community as a whole. And this hadn't happened until now. There's a whole lot more to come. Constantine has schemes for setting up a whole mechanism to allow developers to tap into specific discussions, those involving certain subsystems or certain patches, that sort of thing, and not have to subscribe to Linux kernel or other mailing lists as a whole, and be more focused on what they're paying attention to, which is a useful thing, because in fact, very few of us subscribe to Linux kernel as a whole. There's a very small number of crazy people who do this, seeing as you get something like a thousand messages a day in your inbox that way if you do that. So this looks to be interesting. It's going to be, I'm looking forward to seeing how this works out. He's also working on attestation mechanisms so that we can be sure that patches posted to a mailing list actually came from the developer claim they come, claim to come from and so on. There's a lot of good infrastructure work that is being done now. You can read that, the article at that URL to, to learn a bit more about what is going on there. But the, the, end, um, the end result, the result is, all is we have tools, we have tools, and this is going to help us, and this is going to help us scale the community. It's a really welcome development. It's a really welcome development. And I hope that things I hope continue, continue to, go to go forward in that area. area. So, so there's, there's a million really other things, things that I could talk about here. I just sort of typed them until I ran out of, of space on the slide. The kernel community is, is a big place. There's a lot going on. I could talk all day and still not cover them all. But I am going to stop here, give my voice a break, and um, give an opportunity for people to ask questions, of uh, which there have been very few so far. So if you have a question, uh, turn on your video, don't be shy, and, and let's talk for a little bit. And meanwhile, I thank you all for your attention. Somebody must have that question. But if not, then I would like to at least ask anybody who has any feedback about how this works and how things you might like to see change before the Linux Plumbers Conference comes around to send your feedback to the plan planning committee or to me, and um, and we will try to act on it as best we can. Laura. Hey, John, I have a question for you. So uh, you talked about some of the tooling in terms of uh, building that up. What are your thoughts about the feature of continuous integration and testing for the Linux kernel as a whole? Uh, yes, I did not touch on continuous integration at all. I really should have, sorry. Yes, there, there is a lot going on there. We're seeing um, the kernel CI project, which has moved into the Linux Foundation, and is getting more support. And so, I believe that the continuous integration is an important part of, of our testing framework. So yes, I'm glad to see that. That, of course, requires a fair amount of support because you need a lot of machines to do that, especially if you want to have any sort of wide hardware coverage, which for a kernel, you really need to have. You can't just have a machine testing everything. So we need a lot more of that. But um, it's good to see it. This, this all started, I think, with the the zero day bot that was started in Intel some years ago, which really was mostly just doing builds and, and boot testing. And we've gone beyond that. We're seeing more performance oriented testing as well. So continuous integration is a great thing. And some subsystems, 
such as, as graphics have used it to great effect. We need more of it, and I'm, I'm glad that things are happening in that area. Unmuted. Hey, John. Um, what do you think about what's sort of happening in terms of minimum footprint size in the kernel these days, from your perspective, for a build kernel, and how slow it can go or not? Minimum footprint size. You know, there are people who worry about that, but you don't see people worrying about that the way that they used to. Um, and yeah, that's. That is an interesting question. I don't know if the systems that people are deploying on have just gotten big enough that people worry less about footprint than they used to. Um, you know, you see it perhaps as much as anything um, in people working on real time stuff just because they have to have a sense that all the code they're including in the kernel is not going to do anything really stupid, stupid with regard to latency, regard regard that. latency and all that. But a lot of the tiny, but a lot of the tiny, 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 tiny kernel has, effort that used to see has, I mean, I don't see it as much, I mean, I don't see it as much as I used to. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either, I'm just curious. Uh, any feel for what the actual, you know, reasonable kernel size is these days from a footprint perspective? You know, I'm not probably not the best person to ask about. Well, I know. I'm just figuring I can. <laughs> yeah. If there's anybody else um, who out there who has an idea on this, please join in. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Steve has something to say. Okay. But Steve has to unmute to do it. We're, we're not hearing you, Steve. Sorry. Most kernel size, oh, most people do end up trying to upstream stuff. Yeah, I think this is too bad, but um, that's that's the way of it. Maybe in the end, we're just going to configure out all the kernel and you just load what you want to the BPF program and, and the rest goes from there. Okay, another question. Um, what sort of impact do you see with having uh, the diff you know, the compilers? We we talked about tools. You didn't mention compilers, and obviously that's one of the key parts. So, how do you see any do you see any interactions coming in that direction? Um, are you asking about the work to compile with LLVM, for example? Um, well, I mean that of course is is just happening. Android devices, you know, Google just builds with LLVM now. So, for the most part, that that's just a a way of things. LLVM brings a few advantages, I guess. And for now, for the most part, you still need LLVM if you want to compile BPF programs. That sort of thing, although that, that is changing and support is being added, has been added, I believe, to GCC for that. Um, LLVM, I mean, you know, compilers have their, their advantages. It's good to have multiple compilers that compile the kernel. So that helps you to root out things that are specific to particular compilers and um, find problems that are going to bite you someday just because you know, this is the way that GCC has always done it, but it's not necessarily the way any C compiler has to do something. So, so the addition of LLVM is is welcome in that regard, and I think that work is is mostly done at this point. Hey, Bjorn. Hey, John. Um, Lauren, before are great from my perspective for like moving patches from email to Git. Uh, so, is anything going on for the opposite direction? It's still a major hurdle for new contributors to get from their local Git patches to well-formed patches on email. That that is actually part of of the stuff that Constantine is working on. And if you read the article that I linked, he's there are ideas there for for tools that can extract stuff from Git and just package it up and and send it out. And, and reduce that barrier to entry. The idea is to eventually get to a point where you don't have to use email to be a part of the kernel development process, both because it is a barrier to entry to, to all these young kids coming in these days who don't know how real tools work um, or just don't want to deal with it. It's really the, more, the better way to put that. Um, I think there are better ways of doing things. And also the fact that email, in a lot of ways, is looking like a less viable way of of basing your development community in general, as it becomes increasingly difficult to 
manage your own email system outside of a very small number of large providers is becoming essentially another managed web service in a proprietary way. And that scares a bunch of us. Anybody else? Yeshua? I don't hear you either. Yeah, it looks like you went and listened only. Maybe do you have your microphone turned on? Um, if you drop out quickly and come back in, you might be able to ask a question. Um, but um, as it is, I, I cannot hear you. Sorry. Um, I can. So the server this is running on is at 90% idle, so we've not succeeded in the stress testing, it, which actually makes me happy. Um, if you think we can handle um, bigger crowds than we thought we might be able to. Um, if, if there are no more questions, then maybe I will conclude things. At this point, we can give Shua a moment to come back if she wants to. Um, and otherwise, um, I will thank you all for your attention, for helping us to stress test things. We may do one or more, two or more of these before the actual conference. And we definitely look forward to seeing you all at the Linux Plumbers Conference at the end of next month. Ah, OK, here comes somebody. They're here. Go ahead. So one question that comes to mind when uh, looking at those virtual conferences is why are we setting a schedule of a uh, few days following one another uh, as opposed to like maybe do the conference every Thursday or something I don't know uh, ongoing we, we have discussed this um, in various ways of doing this and trying to find ways that will work with as many many people as possible we are seeking to expand it out to five days rather than three and that's mostly because I don't see I mean, we don't see any way to, to do it a full day. If we're going to try to include as many people as possible, we have relatively small windows of time that work in in a large number of time zones. Um, yeah, and also the span of attention is much is much yes. shorter. Yes, yes. Video conferences are 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 strained to be in that way. So so it will be shorter days. But I don't think we want to really try to spread it out over a longer period. At least we haven't really considered that. You know, there's, there's a period of time when you're going to ask people to set aside time and be a part of this conference and be a part of the many events that are happening. And, and who knows, maybe spreading it out would work better, especially if we end up doing this. If we end up doing this for years, then that may be the mode we end up in. For the Linux Plumbers Conference, that wasn't quite what we were thinking so far. Um, maybe we're wrong. Okay. Uh, one comment along those lines is that there are individual subsystems that have started experimenting with weekly video conferences. I believe the EBPF folks started doing that. Uh, EXT4 had weekly teleconferences, and we actually have switched to weekly uh, video conferences. Uh, so I think that works well for subsystem. Uh, you know, meetings, it's almost sort of like a ongoing mini conference, uh, but that's maybe not quite the same as plumbers. Yeah, we're, we're still figuring out the best way to do all of this. Yeah, we are. All right, well, speaking of conferences being great, we've all been here for an hour now. Um, so unless somebody pops up really quick, I'm going to suggest that it is time to, to wind down. I'll thank you once again for, for being here and your questions. And um, oops, here's Shua again. Let's, let's, last question. First of all, I wanted to thank you. This is great. Um, and also 
kind of test our infrastructure as well, doing all of this uh, sharing and such. It's great. Thank you. And then I was going to ask you a quick question about um, uh, putting a plugin for a car to check that I have been using. It's been finding a lot of problems as well. And then I have some data to share. I have been going, looking at um, from 2002 all the way to now, see how many bugs are being reported by which tool. I can share that data with you if you want to use it in your presentation when you actually do the presentation. And then also I was kind of thinking, um, the case of test is another thing that probably we should promote some more in your talks. Um, it's because we are asking people to write tests and the test is always a problem. Tools and tests and doc documents, these are, it seems like they are not one of those things that people uh, want to contribute or it's not, it's not as glamorous as doing uh, core kernel code. So we want to kind of promote that as well. Um, maybe that would be something that if you can do in your talk. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the testing stuff, I mean, I think it's important. It needs a lot more attention than than it gets, you know, I mean, more than the one slide that I gave it for sure. Um, this is true of many things. Uh, but yeah, case self test, all the testing effort, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's one of the most Can important things that's going on, which is why I included it all as opposed to uh, many of the other things going on that I haven't been able to fit in at all. And um, definitely thanks for all that. Thank you. All right, well, I think we're done. Um, thank you all very much, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you um, at the Linux Bonus Conference.